Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love in War Games. In this video, we are going to take a look at how to start with the Imperium faction in Dystopian Wars, thanks to the Imperium starter set, the aptly named starter set. And we'll have a look at what you get inside. Uh, first of all, how the Imperium plays, how you can build your different ships in there. And there are lots of options, so let's cover all of this. And we will, yeah, just give you also some tips on not only how to play, but how to expand if you like the game and you want some more boxes after the Imperium starter set. So this was an old release, like oldish. It's from the February 2023. And uh, while I record this video, we are in December. So it's been a while, but I got some delay. There has been a lot of release with the starter sets and I was not sure I would do uh, every single faction. For example, the Imperium is not a faction that I personally play, though I play against it often. And uh, there has been just now a new Orbit for the Imperium, the 3.05 version, thanks to the Falkenstein release. And uh, because of this, uh, I'm like, okay, you know what, I am going to make this start. A few people are like, yeah, how can I start with the Imperium? So let's have a look on how you can start this faction, what you get inside the box, and before anything, and before anything, uh, let's have a look at what is the Imperium playstyle. So the first thing to note is that they're very strong. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, they, they are. They have consistently been some of the top factions in the game. Uh, they are uh, aggressively costed. They are very good at multiple ranges, especially point blank, but basically all the ranges, they are good. Uh, they have some quite esoteric weapons in the sense that most of their weapons have electrical benefits. They are voltaic or this kind of thing. Uh, so it means that they sometimes have one or two dices less, but they highly compensate by um, more quality firepower. So this is something to take into consideration. Uh, they do have different weapons, which means it's harder than in some of the other faction to switch uh, from the Imperium to another faction. Uh, usually like a heavy gun battery is the same in every faction. Well, the Imperium doesn't have a heavy gun battery. They have a heavy volt gun battery, which is something different with different stat, different keywords, etc. So they do their little thing in their own style. They are usually quite fast, like uh, even though they have quite heavy ships, uh, they are surprisingly fast. And most of their deadliest electrical firepower is obviously at point blank. So it's really a faction that loves to just charge forward. They don't have the same resilience as other faction. They're not fragile per se, but for the point cost, they are not the same as Union or Commonwealth. They are not like super tough uh, for the cost. Uh, same for the Crown, they're very tough. Like those guys, you need to keep them a little bit in cover, especially some of the other sub factions like the Aerial Zeppelins or the Scandinavians. They're really fragile for their point cost. Uh, they will not die fast, but they will die at some point, and you will lose a lot more points than they do. Though, they are quite fun for beginners because the playstyle is quite easy. Point your ships at the opponent, charge forward, uh, shoot them and board them. And they have some very uh, efficient tools. Uh, they are quite permissive to mistakes because even though you have elite ships that you don't want to lose, uh, they are tough. So it's not because you didn't hide good behind an island or something that you will instantly die. Uh, no, that's not how it works. They have some very tough flagships that we will see in a second. And yeah, they are very fun to play. Great faction to start. And without further ado, let's look at what you have inside the box. So, for the price of 72 euros, you do get quite a lot of things. Uh, this is a starter set and uh, you do get a lot for your money. Not only in terms of miniatures, which as you can see, you do get quite a few, but you also get a lot of stuff uh, here. You have dices, you have the latest rulebook, you have some cards, which are very important to play, like Valor cards that gives you point or super abilities. You have the uh, movement tools. You have some tokens, very important because you will get, uh, they are very needed. And you also have a map of the world. So you do have a lot of goodies on the side, which uh, already would raise the price quite high. But on top of that, you do have quite a lot. The flagship, the Prussian battleship that you get is actually quite thick and quite big. Like it's, uh, it's a large ship and uh, you have quite a few options on how to build. And it's really the linchpin of all the Prussian forces. Uh, all of the ships that you will get there are good ships. Uh, sometimes, you know, like in some starters, you're like, yeah, this is very good, but those are like, yeah, whatever. Uh, here, it, it, all of them are good. The, uh, 
Prussian battleships especially. As you can see, there are four variants that you can build. Well, actually two main variants, the Elector and the Kaiser pattern Elector, and each of them have a named variant. Then you have two uh, Prussian frontline cruisers. You have the basic but very good Blotcher, Artillery Augustus, or the default Schomburg. And then you have two support cruisers. Uh, each of them can be built either at the Erkatkaya or the Conrad. And you have the latest cruise, which the much uh, cooler air style. Uh, for those of you who start <laughs> dystopian wars, there those were some of the first cruises ever released, and the first Conrad carrier had like this kind of like very uh, just have, have a look. Uh, the flight deck was pointing upward and it was super weird like <laughs> it was very fun they remade the spruce because really it was needed uh, you can have the writer the entire variant or the volsung the one with the giant electro cannon at the front you also have four uh, frig frigates those are the arminius uh, quite small and default and good but they yeah, they're fine they're fine you will see them in a minute and then four uh, prussian destroyers can be either the totem if you want to play the uh, Teutonic Orders or the Sigimer for the Prussians, both are really good and we'll talk about them in detail later. You also have some SRS tokens, uh, the Blitz and Bombers, because even the Conrad uh, carrier can send some heavy bombers, and as well two um, SRS tokens for the default like Prussians uh, aircrafts. Uh, that look like well yeah they, they all of the ships, uh, especially the aircrafts, are very like historical themed um, inspired, let's say. So you do get a lot of things, and uh, as we can see, 72 euros, you have everything you need to play. Uh, this is uh, already enough to get like around the 750 points-ish uh, points range, and this is uh, like already a fleet in a box, like not a massive fleet, but if you have like two, uh, two cruisers, two support cruisers, a battleship, and eight mass ones, it's very good to have your first game, or even your first, I don't know, five games, uh, and have fun while you learn the game. There are some variants, of course, um, as always for this box and all the Dystopian Wars boxes, it's always better to magnetize whenever you have the chance, because uh, first of all, the uh, turrets fit very well without gluing, and then you can just move them around uh, without even magnetizing, and if you magnetize, it's even nicer and more comfortable. We will see that there are a lot of variants, and uh, except, like, it is the exception when you can not magnetize something in Dystopian Wars. So always take this into consideration. Still, what we are going to do now is we're going to talk about each variant of those ships and see how you can play them and what playstyle it uh, will produce and how to best uh, make use of them. All right, we start with the Elector battleship, the default variant. Uh, it is tough. Uh, for the point cost, it is the toughest version because it's quite cheap at 239 points. Uh, but it is cheap, not without a reason. Uh, the frontal weaponry is this heavy uh, like artillery piece, which is fine, but it's not the craziest version ever. It does have a, the special rule focus bombardment, which means that a single attack uh, using the bombard uh, will gain plus 5 to its action dice pool, which is good, and you will reroll blanks. So that is very good, especially since it is not a valor effect. You don't need to spend a card to activate this. This means that, as you can see, uh, from the closing range all the way to extreme range, so from 10 inches up to 40 inches, you can shoot this. It's going to be 16 dices uh, sustained, plus rerolling blanks. So you roll two types of dices, and gonna re well, this is more like <laughs> not, it's not a bonus in this case, but it, it is there. So it is quite good. Plus you gain spotter. Uh, this is not really needed because you already reroll blanks from the focus bombardment. Uh, but if your enemy has a shroud or something, just having some aircraft next to your target will mean that you will ignore the obscured quality of your opponent. So that is good. You also have modular configuration. Uh, this is more like, I guess, if you play in a tournament, uh, you can switch the weapons. As you can see, it has two uh, heavy gun batteries to the front. Uh, to the rear, sorry, and you can switch them to the front if you want during deployment because the whole Prussian theme is that they are very modular in their weaponry. So that is fun. I'm not sure you will use it that often, especially since you can reduce the cost of the model uh, by removing a single heavy volt gun battery with some of those generators. Most of them are fine. If your enemy has many aircrafts, magnetic is good. If you want to be a good border, fury is fine. Shield gives you quite some boost against uh, smaller attacks, uh, which will force your opponent to really link everything that it has. But 
for me, uh, the one thing that you want is a shroud generator because you will replace uh, this, I, I don't know if you see my mouse, but this specific uh, turret here, uh, which only has the aft uh, um, firing angle, which is bad because like <laughs> you will rarely have a target exactly behind you. So you can replace this uh, with indeed a uh, shroud generator. And then what happens? You are much, much tougher. Um, it's uh, like it's insane the difference that you can make because uh, as you might know, like you, um, in dystopian wars, there is an explosive die system in the sense like if you make a six, what we call explosive die, uh, you roll another die. And then if you make another six, you can roll another die and then another die. And this happens at least once per video. If you watch some of our uh, battle reports, at least once someone is in a crazy roll and gets like, I don't know, a very insane roll thanks to this roll. And the shroud prevents any explosive uh, dice. So you cannot roll another dice. And this really boosts those very tough ships. It has armor 8 and citadel 16 and 9 hull points before it gets crippled, but then it dies fast. And this really helps you to uh, counter the big firepower of your opponent and you will need to spend so much more firepower to sink you down and for 239 points is fine uh, though there is one thing to take into consideration is that you have a storm generator as well and this can also boost even further your firepower in the sense that it's a weapon like electric weapon that you can use at closing if you use it uh, then your enemy will have to re-roll the double hits that it does on you and this combined with the shroud is actually quite insane. This thing takes so much firepower to sink, and um, especially if you use mostly uh, its heavy torpedoes that are right here, and its artillery, uh, because then you will stay very far away from the opponent, and it will have to spend so much more uh, resource to sink you, especially since it will not have a lot of good firepower. The one thing he is vulnerable against is torpedoes, uh, because it will ignore the shroud and the uh, storm generator. But, 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 uh, you have a SDV of 7, which is actually very reasonable. You can take some escort tokens as well, up to 3 of them, very good. And yeah, you can attach some ships to even further your defenses. If you buy this ship, I would recommend uh, to keep the twin uh, bombard. It's very good. And I would also uh, recommend to upgrade for five points for, for phosphor shells. It's always good hazard. It will bring more disorder to your opponent. And it's always nice for five points for, on such a, a tough platform. I would never see. Why not? The named version is the SMS Brandenburg. And this guy has some interesting stuff. Uh, first of all, you see that it's uh, more expensive, 11 points more, okay. It d trades the rear weapons with uh, yet another Gustav Heavy Bombard, uh, okay, fine. Uh, it's cheaper to upgrade to the Bertha Heavy Bombard, which is fine, because I think you do want to do that. Uh, what it gets is that uh, you may uh, still gain a plus 5 to your uh, dice action pool, and you still reroll blank, so it's basically the same thing. And you also gain more victory points if you destroy this ship while being union. Okay. Uh, you have inbuilt phosphor shells, so that is something to take into consideration. And otherwise, it's basically all the same. You do have coastal bombardment, whatever. It's a little fluffy note. It's fine. But what I really like with this uh, ship is that uh, you have a cheaper Bertha heavy bombard. And it's going to be 14 dice, but this guy can shoot in a blast. So it's less about pure damage, but you ignore shield and you are a blast, uh, which means that you can hit multiple ships at the same time under your template. And this makes it a very, very powerful ship in the sense uh, that it uh, stays all the way in the back and it will force, just by being there, your opponent to spread out and it will be much more difficult for your opponent to move its ships because it knows there is this threat of having this huge uh, Bertha heavy bombard uh, coming right at them. I would probably, in the rear, keep the basic Gustav Heavy Bombard because you will not use it often. And usually, if there is an enemy to your rear, it is going to be a giant robot. And um, yeah, if it attacks you, well, yeah, it's going to be difficult. But if it attacks some of your Kyra that are in the back or something, uh, you will not need Blast. What you will need is to just make one devastating volley. So yeah, both uh, Brandenburg and the basic Elector are fine. You can switch the weapons. It's not because I say the Brandenburg is better with the Bertha. Like they're very similar, so you can choose whichever you want. If you are a new player, I would recommend the default Elector with a shroud to get a little bit tougher, so it's more forgiving of mistakes. Uh, the Brandenburg is fine, up to you. Then we go to the Kaiser Patton Elector battleship. 
heavy battleship, sorry. And there you see like we're in another category of price already. It's 299 points, it's basically 300 points, which is a huge uh, price bump. And you're like, whoa, what the hell? What happens? Why would I pay so much? Well, that is a good question. There is two huge difference for this uh, little guy. Uh, first of all, it has Fortunes of War, which is probably the most important rule that you need to have in your fleet, uh, which allows you to counter the opponent's valor effect uh, with your own cards. If you don't have a source of Fortunes of War, or the another version, the Devil's Own Luck, uh, the enemy will be able to dictate his uh, game plan and you will not be able to do anything. It's going to be like, you know what, I'm going to make this super combo to really obliterate your ship and you have no way to answer. So it is important to have a source of Fortunes of War especially on such a tough ship, because until you are crippled and you are Armor 8, Citadel 16, you will also, of course, upgrade a Shroud and you will also have a Storm Generator uh, active uh, when you can uh, use it. And since you want to be charging, you will activate it quite fast, your Storm Generator. So until you, you lose your 9 hull points, you will have Fortunes of War. That is very good. And the second big upgrade that the Kaiser gets is Ablative Armor which means that unless against some very specific like weapons, like torpedoes, or for example, things with piercing or rail quality, which are really like not everywhere at all, uh, against all the other weapons, the first three explosives, like you will not be able to reroll the first three explosives. And the, then you might say like, okay, so it's kind of like a shroud, it is. Um, so there's a little difference about uh, weapons that can breach one or the other, but then, um, you can say, uh, and you would be very white, uh, why would I buy a um, shroud generator for this? And uh, well, buy, you do get a discount for having a shroud. But you are very white right in asking this, if you already had this, and you might say like, but then I want a shield to be even tougher. However, uh, recently, well, no, not recently, but there has been an update that says you cannot use a shield and be obscured at the same time. However, However, Ablative Armor is not being obscured. So when you have a Kaiser, it can be up to debate, but what I would do is to actually put a shield generator to the rear. But yeah, I started saying the shroud, but it was so you have the whole thinking process going all the way to the end. So yeah, because if you have a shield, it's minus three dices for almost any uh, enemy attack, except again, torpedoes. Uh, and then the first three explosives uh, will be uh, not counted as explosives, and it's quite rare when the enemy does more. And you also have a storm generator as well. So that starts to be a super, super tanky ship. And yeah, shield plus ablative armor is such a good combo. You can also put magnetic generator to be more uh, resilient against uh, aerial attack and SRS tokens. Or if you really want to be a crazy border, which you can, you have prey 14 from the base, you can put a fury and then you're just going to obliterate anything you get close to uh, between your heavy broadside and your boarding actions. Overall, is it worth the plus 50 points? Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, Ablative Armor and Shield is a combo that I love. Uh, Fortunes of War is super important, but paying plus 50% just for uh, translating the Shroud into Ablative plus Shield and Fortunes of War, I'm not sure I am so crazy about it. 50, 50 points is huge. It's a massive increase. And uh, while it is very tough, I am not sure it's so neat. If you are a new player and uh, for your first couple games, I would say like, yes, play the Kaiser Patton heavy battleship because it's a very, very forgiving ship. You can throw it in the middle of the enemy fleet and it has a very reasonable chance to survive between all of its defensive boosts. Just remember to tell your opponents, if your opponent is also discovering dystopian wars, that yeah, you do have ablative armor, you do have shield, you do have storm generator. So remind all this to your opponent so it doesn't die faster than it's supposed to. Uh, but yeah, once you have played your first few games, maybe you will want uh, the more basic uh, elector to get a little bit better efficiency for your points. And then you have the named variant, the SMS Tirpitz. So this guy is, <laughs> as you can see, super expensive. It has an inbuilt shroud generator. So it's a little bit like you don't have a choice of having a shield, which is a bit sad because the shroud does not combo very well, as we've said with the ablative armor. First point that makes you say like, yeah, uh, it does have uh, elite crew as well, which is uh, something that will um, 
give you more boost uh, in melee. Fine. Maritime Patrol is the new rule. You don't care. And the thing that makes me sad is that it loses Fortunes of War for Command Codes. Command Codes allow you to, once per turn, uh, per battle round, uh, to select uh, one unit that is around and say like, okay, you had a very bad roll, reroll everything. Full rerolls like this are very rare uh, in the game, so it is worth uh, something for sure. But is it worth losing Fortunes of War? I'm absolutely not sure. Especially, especially since you have a Shroud Generator instead of a Shield, which as we've said, combo very badly with Ablative Armor. The one thing that is very, very fun, uh, but is it worth uh, all the all the trades? I'm not sure. The other thing that is very fun is the Ivaldi Shroud Generator, which uh, used to be a Scandinavian technology that we see on the Loki, Loki Cruiser, for example. And uh, this allows you, uh, before you start to move, you can basically teleport within five inches of your position. So it's quite fun. There are some quite some tricks. First of all, it can make you faster. If you do, go, just go straight, it's like five inches more movement. That is already really good. And it can also make some trickery, like you can really hide behind an island, uh, being like, okay, I'm gonna uh, hit the island next turn because of my drift. But no, you teleport around, and this allows you to stay very well hidden until the last moment when you can teleport and then charge forward. Uh, it's fun. It is fun for sure. I actually quite like this rule. It's kind of like the Mirage uh, reactor for the Sultanate. But is it worth uh, the other concessions, like having this inbuilt shroud? paying more and losing fortunes of war? No, I would say no. Uh, you can try it, of course. It's not a bad ship for sure, but in terms of points, I think it's too high. And uh, having a Blative Armor and a Shroud is always something that makes me say like, eh. Kind of like the Kiev um, pattern, like the named Kiev ship for the Bo Borodino variant for the Commonwealth. Uh, in this sense, I'm like, eh, no, it's not. It's not something that I'm willing to pay. Still fun, still fun. Uh, and uh, it is very expensive, so if you are a new player and you want to reach 1000 points or something and you want the most expensive variant uh, possible, uh, you don't go wrong with the Tirpitz, it, it's still a really fine ship. And now we start to have a look at the cruisers. So the, the Blotcher is the default um, cruiser that you will get for the Prussians, you can build up to two of them on the front lines cruise. And what do you get for the Blotcher? It is exactly 100 points, so it can be like a kind of like a standard with which we will compare the other ships. And it has um, the heavy volt gun batteries, which are like basically it shoots a little bit less dices, but it is a little bit more powerful than normal heavy gun batteries. Fine. Same, same with the torpedoes, Spearschlauders. They're like little variant, but they're still just basically torpedo salvos. What it does have is a discipline, which uh, allows it to remain efficient even if it starts to get a lot of disorder tokens. And Luftlancer Assault, which allows it to do boarding from further away. And with free 9, which is absolutely non negligible, uh, this is something you might want to do. And finally, the last thing, but you should not forget at all, is that it can be attached to a Prussian flagship. It has two forward heavy bolt gun batteries which means that you can attach a blotcher to a uh, Kaiser Elector, for example, or any ship with heavy uh, bolt gun batteries to the front, the Tirpitz as well, okay? Uh, and they can link their firepower together. The Tirpitz will probably want to have heavy firepower or something like this, but then you can also uh, use the blotcher as fire support. Same with the torpedoes, he can uh, help, uh, he can use his torpedoes to support uh, his flagship. So there is actually a good combo, I would absolutely recommend in this box that you build at least one blotcher and that you consider every game to uh, attach it to your Prussian battleship, whichever it is. Even if you build, for example, uh, let's say the Brandenburg, uh, then you can uh, upgrade for heavy shock rockets uh, from further away, still shoot from quite far, so it, your blotcher will become kinda an artillery ship, and it's still going to be very fun. So yeah, at least one blotcher is always a good choice. It is reasonably choi uh, tanky at armor 6, Citadel 12, 4 hull points have already in 4 and crippled. It's basically the very standard, all of this, but because of its fine free value, that it is disciplined and that it has good weapons, and especially that it can be attached, for only 100 points, I would say, yes, it is very good, and you should build at least once. 
Then you have the Augustus Bombardment Cruiser. It has the Gustav that you can upgrade as a Berta for the main artillery weapon that we've seen uh, for the flagships. And it has a special rule, which is Heavy Bombardment, which allows you to support with a lead value. It's basically, um, it, it's heavy firepower, but for this uh, unit, which means that if you have two or three Augustus uh, Bombardment Cruisers, you can really make one single big, very powerful, devastating attack. I'm not sure that if uh, this is the first box you buy for the Imperium, you want to buy two Augustus to do that. Not sure at all. But if you have the box, having one Augustus uh, cruiser in the rear with either the Berta, either the Gustav as a fire support, uh, plus the torpedoes, which are also extreme range, uh, is not a bad choice at all. You also have Spotter, which is fine if you have a carrier somewhere in your fleet, either with the box, either uh, with the boxes that you will buy later down the line. So yeah, the Augustus is a fine ship, uh, absolutely not overpowered, uh, there are some better artillery ships in the game, but especially if you upgrade it with the uh, Berta which has the Blast template, it can really, really help you a lot to handle the enemy mass 1 ships. And then you have the Schomburg Escort Cruiser, which, uh, which I really like, it is very cheap, uh, at 57 points, it has heavy escort, which is never something to uh, forget. Uh, you gain plus two dices to your defense, like against uh, aerial attacks, against torpedoes, against boardings, that's very good. It's also a landing vessel, uh, we don't have rules for landing scenarios yet, but it might be good later. Landing vessel, one landing vessel at 57 points, that is mass two, so putting two tokens, it's going to be nice. It is mine sweeper, which is appreciable. Mine layer, even better, mines are quite powerful and can really force your opponent to avoid them. And uh, it can be attached which means that it can link its spear schlauder, its tor torpedoes, and it also has for 57 points heavy broadsides. Wow, really? Like, uh, it is a very good package for the price. And uh, heavy broadsides, especially even more if you link with, I don't know, the heavy broadsides of your flagship, uh, that is going to be quite, quite good. Like, really? Uh, my recommendation would be to build also a Schomburg. To be honest, only the front part here uh, changes between an Augustus or Blutcher or Schomburg. So you can always just, just magnetize or just not glue them at all, and it, it will be fine. But yeah, the Schomburg is really something that is worth your consideration. It is a little bit less resilient because it has only three four points in cripple, but it is almost half the price of the Blutcher and more than half the price of the Augustus. So it is very uh, good, cheap ship. And uh, yeah, always consider one Schomburg if you don't use a Blutcher attached to your flagships. And now we start to have a look at the support uh, cruisers for the Prussians. And those you will be able to build two of them again because you will have two sprues. So before we've seen the front line, now the support. The Conrad is a support carrier with a SRS capacity of 4 slash 2. So 4 while well, it is in battle already, only 3 whole points before it gets crippled. And when it's crippled, it has 5 whole points, which is good, but then it only launches two SRS tokens. A eh, bit sad. It can also be attached, uh, which is fun. Uh, if you see that your opponent has a lot of shroud and stuff, you can attach it to your flagship, for example, if you have an artillery flagship, uh, because then it means that you can, in the same activation, start by sending the SRS tokens from the Conrad, your uh, target will have some aircrafts on him, and then in the same activation you will shoot with your artillery that will trigger the spotter roll, because there will be aircraft next to your opponent. So again, depends on your fleet composition, depends on the opponent in front, but having a Conrad attached to your ship can be very fine. If you play in a tournament or something, you can absolutely in your fleet have a Blotcher, have a Schomburg, have a Conrad for example, and decide in the beginning of the game during deployment who will be attached to who. So if you see your opponent has a lot of shroud and uh, he's going to be obscured all the time etc and you have an artillery ship, uh, for example the Elector with which remember you can switch your weapon loadout, uh, then you can absolutely attach the Conrad to the Elector, put the artillery weapon to the front, and then tr use a spotter with the aircraft on the Conrad. That it is what I would say is the main use of the Conrad, because it is expensive-ish at 135 points, and uh, it is fragile. Like, it only has uh, um, torpedoes, it has broadsides, uh, fine, and uh, that's it. it. Even though it has a little arti uh, entire artillery on the top, it does not have either flag broadside either another weapon on. It only has this, it's a bit sad, but it's how it is. And you can upgrade uh, your unit uh, with the Aces of Rendsburg. 
and then you uh, lose the piercing quality which is extremely sad and you get voltaic and sustained uh, i am not sure that i'm very happy with that uh, because yeah it, it's a free upgrade uh, and i understand why it's free because uh, piercing is really good especially if you have only one carrier uh, voltaic and sustained is fine but many times i will prefer to have piercing so yeah we'll have to see having one conrad though uh, in your list is never a bad idea especially with the latest night scenarios which really really insists that you have aircraft to spot the enemy because otherwise uh, it's really really difficult to hit them and yeah last thing that i was saying like this uh, thing is not uh, it's on the model but you cannot have it actually i am uh, mista like mistaken, I'm not a Imperium player and we can see. Uh, you can actually have an extra weapon right here, a Volt Gun Battery, a Veerling Auto Cannon, or a Shock Rocket Battery with 360 points. Um, I would always bring the Veerling Auto Cannon because uh, yeah, the other are fine. Actually, I don't know. O all of them are good, but I do like the entire appearance of this uh, Veerling uh, Auto Cannon and it is a good weapon. The Veerling Auto Cannon is really, really a good weapon. If you have only one, like one Volt Gun Battery will do almost nothing. Same for the Shock Rocket. A single Veerling Auto Cannon, especially against uh, scheming units, for example, uh, will really be a big threat and will keep the enemy away from you. And now we have a look at the Reiter Flag Cruiser. Uh, this little beauty that you can see, the picture is painted by uh, Daz, from the official painter for Red Cradle, and this ship is very naughty. Uh, for 129 points, you have the same stat line, like with everything. You do have, by default, the Veerling Auto Cannon on top, which you can replace for the Shock Rocket Battery, but don't, <laughs> uh, because your main weapon is the Veerling uh, Flak Array, and as you can see, it's a very powerful weapon, it is sustained, and if you aim at a scheming or aerial unit, you will be able to link with your Veerling auto cannon, which is only sustained against scheming and aerial. Uh, otherwise, they can shoot at different targets. Uh, you also have broadside torpedoes, as always. It can be attached to a flagship, uh, which I would not recommend with your tear pits and uh, stuff. Uh, it's good if you attach it, for example, to the newest uh, Falkenstein, because uh, he can have yeah, himself a Veerling flag array and then you can link everything together. We'll talk about the Falkenstein a little bit at the end with the boxes you can buy, a little spoiler. Uh, and also with the Tempelhof, uh, which is the aircraft carrier, the big, like middle-sized uh, aircraft carrier for the Prussians. Uh, we will not talk about it uh, in the expansion options, but yeah, if you do get the Tempelhof, you can have the writer and link everything because the Tempelhof does have some Veerling autocannons and uh, if you aim at aerial or scheming, and there are more and more of those type of ships in the game, they will be able to link all together. Uh, one thing that you can get is the Freya Arrays, which is fine. Uh, you can remove your autocannons, and uh, it gives you some bonuses. It especially prevents the enemy from uh, popping next to you too early. Uh, but it's a fine zone of effect, but your enemy will usually be able to play around it. So I'm not sure it's such a good idea to lose some firepower for something that you maybe will uh, force your opponent to not be ideal, but you're really not sure. I would choose firepower over this uh, all the time. The last thing that it has, and it's actually huge, is Flag Barrage 10. Flag Barrage 10 is one of the highest Flag Barrage value of the entire game, and it means that when there are uh, enemy aircrafts around you, uh, you really, really will be able to uh, shoot uh, very efficiently uh, all around. That is uh, fine, like uh, it's uh, actually quite good. You will, on average, remove almost two SLS tokens uh, per, like at the end phase, which is good. It's um, quite efficient. It means that if you have, for example, two writers, uh, you can absolutely uh, entirely neuter an entire enemy aircraft carrier just with a flag barrage, uh, just because you will shoot down all the aircrafts. And then the enemy uh, aircraft carrier will be basically defenseless and you will still have all your weapons your flak array and stuff to shoot at it. So that's good. It's also an anti-air specialist, uh, which is good because it means it doesn't consider the enemy as being one range bent further away, which would be very annoying for the flak array because it means you would need to be at point blank always. Um, and yeah, it's very uh, important role because otherwise uh, it's anti-air role in the sense of shooting down not only SLS but also air cruisers. Uh, it would be much harder without this role. Thanks to this, you can shoot at them and ignore the aerial special rules that usually say that they are considered to be a little bit further away. 
and the last uh, version that you can build with your Prussian support cruisers is the Volsung Strike Cruiser. 123 points. Uh, funny thing, you can have it uh, in the Prussian or the Scandinavian uh, fleets, um, even though it looks physically like a Prussian ship. Still fine. It has the usual Virling auto cannon on the top, which you can replace, but probably no, don't want to. And uh, this guy, this guy, its main role, as you can see from the picture, it has a huge gun and it wants to charge at the enemy and just obliterate at point blank range. It's a weapon that is sustained, devastating, and arc. And because you have focused gunnery, it, you will also reroll the blanks. So it's very precise, very powerful. Uh, having a lot of rerolls uh, while being devastating is something that you will really appreciate. Even at closing, it's going to be nine dices, and the enemy uh, is not going to joke at all. And when you get at point blank, it's going to be 14 dices, always plus two because of focus gunnery, and all the rerolls. And it means you will for sure do a ton of damage at point blank and almost uh, outright destroy uh, a cruiser if you shoot before even the boarding and the broadside and torpedoes, just, just the main weapon. And if you shoot at a battleship, for example, there is a very big chance that you will just outright uh, make a critical damage roll and two hull points on any battleship that you see at point blank. It's arcs, so you even uh, don't care about things like shield generator and stuff, like it's very, very powerful weapon. Um, having two Volsungs is expensive, but it can absolutely be uh, understandable. <laughs> like those are huge threats and there is a gameplay style of the Prussians, which is just charge everything forward uh, with all your point blank weapons, like your mass ones, your mass twos and stuff. And um, yeah, the, the enemy cannot handle all of you uh, in time. And if you hide on top of that behind islands, uh, this can be a very, very powerful play style. The Stormbreaker is one of the most powerful weapons of the game and having one on the fast uh, ship because yeah, speed uh, nine, uh, speed nine uh, is reasonably fast, and you have elite crew as well if you want to board. Ah, la, la, it, it starts to be a lot. Like for the point cost, it is a very, very good ship, and I, you can absolutely build two Heiter, but you can also build two Volsungs. And again, the Prussians are, are very modular, so you can just magnetize this and uh, play it as a Heiter or as a Volsung, depending on the tournament or etc like you can make some try one of them a weekend and another one the other weekend they are very modular and you don't have to glue them at all and i would not recommend you to do that okay we finished with the mass two crews now we have a look at the mass ones and we start with the arminius frigates uh, those uh, you have four of them and there is no choice it will be four arminius frigates but you are fine with that because uh, it's actually a good uh, little ship it is prussians uh, you can also include them in Teutonic Battle Fleet, uh, you don't care about this right now. It is fragile-ish at uh, armor 5, Citadel 10 and 3 hull points. Citadel 10 means that since you are mass 1, if the Citadel is breached, you will be destroyed outright. Uh, doesn't need to take all your hull points uh, down. No, you will die. Uh, sorry. Uh, what you do get is, uh, for this, a Volgan battery, which is a good weapon. You are quite cheap at 29 points. It's actually really cheap. Uh, you have a fine fray value with elite crew, which means reroll blanks. And if you start to have a lot of ships, you can have a unit of up to eight ships in a single unit. Uh, eight Arminius coming for the boarding. Let me tell you that there is not many ships in the game, even very powerful battleships that are a lot of defenses. Nobody likes to get boarded by eight Arminius. And um, you are almost guaranteed to succeed your boarding and to cause a carnage result, doing a ton of damage on the opponent if you manage to board. Plus they are very fast, speed 13, wow! They are also disciplined, well you don't care that much, but yeah, they have pack hunter, which means that if you start to have more and more ships, uh, you can boost a single attack and uh, have more and more dices, you can really uh, obliterate the enemy. The Arminius is really a wolf pack, if you have two of them, it's a cheap activation. You can use it to gain some time and force your opponent to activate first to see kind of like what is his first move. Uh, it's a cheap 58 points and you can just be like, okay, I'm not doing much, but whatever, I gain some time and some many times like turn one and even beginning of turn two sometimes, you want to the opponent to play first. So having cheap activations is fine. But eight Arminius is not the same deal at all. Yes, it is much more expensive, absolutely. But eight Arminius is a threat. And they are mass ones, so all gunnery weapons are obscured against them. 
and uh, this means that they are annoy annoyingly difficult to deal with. I mean, if your opponent dedicates heavy firepower on them, they will die, no questions. But at 29 points per model, does he want to spend all his heavy firepower to destroy your frigates? Absolutely not. But if he doesn't take care of them, with Pack Hunter they will shoot him very well, and if they get into boarding range, damn, you will really have a bad time. They are very vulnerable to blast templates. But uh, apart from that, like if your enemy has blast, spread out, yes. But if he doesn't, those things are so annoying. Now we have a look at the destroyers. So there are two variants, the Toten and the Sigimo. Those are already, as you can see, quite more expensive. It's 40 points per model. And yeah, that, that is a significant increase on the Arminius. And it is the same defensive stat line, except this is 11, which will not change that much. It will not save you often. Uh, those guys, they have interesting things. Uh, they can be made as even better borders, okay. Uh, they can be only in a smaller unit because they can be up to five and not up to eight. So yeah, something to take into consideration. They have back counter as well. They have one more weapon and the second weapon has 360 degrees arc, which means they double basically their firepower for, of course, less than double the price, way less. So interesting. Uh, but they are in this sense more of a glass cannon than the Arminius. The Arminius are so cheap that your opponent doesn't want to dedicate firepower to sink them down. Uh, the Sigimers, at 40 points per model, he can start to be like, okay, you know what, I will be fine with uh, sending some lots of torpedoes or something on them to shoot them down because they are a big threat and they did cost my opponent some, uh, some uh, points. So yeah, it is fine to do that. The last thing that I want to point out is that they have attached unit rule. So if you don't want to put a cruiser uh, attached to your uh, flagship, you can absolutely have two Sigimers. First of all, it looks very good. I actually prefer you can put one on each side. It will be a little formation of the fleet, and I like when it happens like this. And um, then you actually uh, gain more uh, as a support to having two Sigimers in support than a Blotcher. A Blotcher will gain two uh, heavy Volgan batteries, uh, which is good. It's, you gain more dices from four small, th those that you see, volt gun batteries, than from two big uh, heavy volt gun batteries. So yeah, they are more fragile, absolutely, but uh, they do bring more firepower even when attached to uh, your flagship. Something to really take into consideration all the time, and you can also upgrade them to have storm clouds. Uh, this we'll see a little bit later. If you want storm clouds, better to wait for the next uh, unit. And the next unit is the Toten Heavy Destroyers. So this guy doesn't have many options. Uh, it has to have Sturm Klaus, uh, which is not what you see on the picture. This is uh, the official uh, picture of the Toten on the Wayland. It's actually not the weapon. This is a he uh, this is a normal Vulcan battery. The Sturm Klaus is basically an electric cannon. You've seen the Sturm Rieger on the Volsung. It's this, but much, much smaller. And uh, as you can see, basically the same profile. Like it cannot shoot at long range. Devastating, arc, but it's not sustained, but it's fine. And it is very powerful. But the thing to consider is that the Toten is 45 points, which is starts to be way more expensive. You are though Citadel 12, and Citadel 12 is the kind of like breakpoint where it starts to be very annoying for your opponent because even three heavy gun batteries uh, shooting at you at long range are not sure to sink you. So that starts to be the breakpoint there that it's annoying. And even uh, two heavy gun batteries at closing range, which is their ideal range, are neither sure to sink you down because you are obscured against gunnery weapons. So Citadel 12 is really the point where the enemy is not sure anymore how to handle you. And what do you have uh, with the Toten? You have advanced storm calls, which means that your storm cloud will get um, devastating, which means that if you could attach them, they would uh, support good the Volsung, but whatever. It just means your Storm Claw are very, very um, powerful, especially when you combine this with focused gunnery, which means that again, you will reroll blanks and reroll one of the two blue uh, dice results that you will get. And at 5 3, it means a minimum sized unit of Toten, 90 points, is going to be. Uh, 14 dices plus 2, 16 dices, devastating, uh, it's going to be sustained, and it's going to be rolling blanks for 90 points. That is insane. This is probably one of the most powerful mass ones of the game, 
And little spoiler, unless you really want to attach Sigimers to your flagship, I would recommend you to play Totems every time. The smaller weapons are harder to not magnetize uh, because they don't fit very well. They're quite small, so they're quite light and they might fall around when you move the miniatures. But if you have, first of all, you can proxy always. Uh, there are small weapons. You can say like, yeah, they're Totems, they're Sigimers. Uh, even in a tournament, your opponent is going to be fine. And uh, second thing is like, I would recommend Totems all the time. That when you will learn a bit more about the game, you will see that there is what we call patrons. And one of the patrons is actually uh, someone from the Teutonic Order. And it allows you to uh, basically deep strike one of your unit. And if you, let me tell you, if you deep strike a unit of five Totem Destroyers, or even four, if you just use what you have in the box, you deep strike four Totem Destroyers, they will pop out. And thanks to the patron, not only they will deep strike, but they will also uh, shoot at full capacity at point blank whenever you want. This is basically a point, click, and delete uh, unit, because that you will just obliterate something, especially if you uh, pay them the Veteran Voltsmeister rule, uh, which means that not only you will obliterate something with all your Storm Clouds, your four Toten will obliterate something with their eight Storm Clouds, and then you will be an absolute monster in boarding with this Veteran Voltmeister, which boosts your boarding. Plus you have Voltaic Deck Sweepers, which boosts your boarding as well. And you have Elite Crew, which further boosts your boarding. So this unit is absolutely insane. They are full of angry Teutonic Elite Knights, and you can feel that. They are expensive, They're probably one of the most expensive mass ones of the game, but they are 100% worth it, and they're even a little bit undercosted. Uh, if your opponent plays against them, the first time he'll be like, oh, they're small, I don't care. The second time, let me tell you, they will be all the way up in his priority list of targets to deal. They're quite small, so when your opponent will understand the danger, always hide them very well. They are speed 11, so quite fast. And always hide them very well. If your opponent has blast, really spread them out. And only charge when your enemy is at least at closing. And you can wait a little bit more to be at point blank, it's fine, but at least at closing because you are literally defenseless against anything that is at long range. And of course, when you will want to be competitive or you don't like your friend for today, uh, you can deep strike them with the uh, Teutonic Knight Patron. Okay, this is all that you get with your starter set. As you can see, quite a few options, quite a few powerful options. And then you're like, okay, I like the play style, or maybe I want to make one big purchase and I want to get a second box, or maybe you already played a few games and you're like, okay, I like the Prussians, I want a little bit more, what do I get? Uh, the Imperium, actually, for those that discover the video, maybe uh, with this, uh, my videos with this, uh, how to start the Imperium, uh, usually I make how to expand and I make three suggestions, but the Imperium has so many options that there's going to be five of them. Let's have a look. There is going to be some variety in there. Uh, but the first one is the most logical expansion. As, as you can see, you can be, oh, isn't that all the ships that I already have? Kind of, kind of. This is the latest release for the uh, Prussians uh, in the Imperium, which is the Falkenstein, Falkenstein, I'm not sure, uh, Battle Fleet set. It is uh, cheaper at 54 euros. And what do you get inside? You get the Falkenstein Battle Carrier, which is the ship that you see here. Quite modulable. The rockets can be uh, flak array if you want to attach the writer. It can be, uh, for example, some rockets as you see here. It can be some artillery that we've seen, same as the Augustus and stuff. So it's actually a very good carrier. Uh, it is tough. It is the same armor and citadel as a battleship. So armor 8, citadel 16, which is insane for a carrier. And it's also sending some SRS tokens left and right. So you don't need to have a Conrad if you have this because it will fill up the role of a battle carrier very well. It is not expensive either. It does have some weaponries. Uh, it is tough. It's sending SLS tokens. I mean, it is good. It is not uh, the ship that will be in the center and shoot around. It will not win an aircraft combat against a dedicated massive aircraft carrier. Yes, but it does everything good. And for the point cost, you want him to do everything. It does have. It is tough. It is cheap. It is sending SLS tokens, so it's doing quite some support. And uh, yeah, it does everything. Like I like the Falkenstein very much. Uh, you also have a Prussian frontline cruiser, so you get three in total. Uh, you will get a Prussian support cruiser, which can only be a Volsung like this, uh, because like, yeah, you will use some parts to build the Falkenstein, like the uh, flight deck you will take from the Conrad, and uh, you might use the artillery uh, of the Augustus uh, to build the, the Falkenstein, depending on the weapons you want. So yeah, 
since everything is modulable and you will not glue everything because you've been listening, uh, you will be able to mix everything. Like if you put the big artillery bits that you have on the Falkenstein, you will be able to build one less Augustus if you wanted a full Augustus list, for example, this kind of thing. But yeah, you will get another support cruiser. You will have two more Arminius frigates, so you will have six in total, very good. Uh, you can make one big pack of six, as we've uh, seen, it can go up to eight, so it's very good. You will have two more Prussian destroyers, uh, so from there you can either make four Totens and two, um, what is the name? two Sigimers uh, to attach them to a flagship, but you can absolutely as well build five Totens because uh, you are a naughty competitive player and you want to deep strike them, and you will have some more uh, SRS tokens. So if you don't know what you want, but you want a little bit more of the same, and you're like, okay, uh, it's not enough for me as a starter set, and I would like to make one big purchase. For example, on my hobby place, which is our partner, you get minus 10% on all the boxes uh, of dystopian wars, plus it helps the channel in the process. So if you're like, okay, I would like to, uh, for the um, delivery price, I would like to get a little bit more than just the starter, the Falkenstein is absolutely the number one suggestion that I will have for you. It complements it so well. A Falkenstein next to a Lector not only will look very cool, but they will complement each other very, very well. And uh, yeah, you will have more of the same ships, so your fleet will be the same. As uh, you will have less hard choices to make, you will have a little bit more of everything. And yeah, very, very good complement. Plus, I just like the style of this ship. Uh, we call it the Frankenstein in our little gaming group. The second option that is really good, uh, a little bit older box that was released some uh, while ago, but also very good, is the Koenig Battlefleet set. Uh, this uh, ship is basically an Elector with, as you can see, a Sturmbringer to the front. Okay, it has two Sturmklaus. If you can see, this is the Sturmklau on the artwork, so it looks like this little Electro Cannon with pointing towards us. So it's hard to see, but yeah, this is a, a Sturmklau. And the thing with the Koenig, uh, it's cheap ish. It is uh, yeah, it's about the same price as the basic Elector, okay. But the thing that makes it very, very interesting, except that it is a point blank variant of the Elector, is that it is a generator ship. So you will have a few generators, and it will give its generators benefits in aura around himself. So you can project an aura of Shroud, for example, which is insane. You can project an aura of uh, Atomic and uh, Fury, for example. So your ships will be very fast, and once you will get... Uh, uh, point blank and boarding range, which will do fast because you will have those generators. You will board the enemy even more efficiently. So yeah, this this is really a very very good ship, and I love the cunning. And there used to be a time when it was absolutely OP because you could combo everything on top of each other, like shield, shroud, everything in aura, so it wasn't killable basically. Uh, now you cannot do this anymore, but it's still absolutely one of the best uh, ship of the Prussians one of the best flagships. And while the other nations, I'm thinking of the Prometheus of the Covenant, uh, which is the Hypatia uh, class, or um, the Prometheus literally that was stolen by the Russian, they have it as well, or the Matsumoto of the Empire, those ships either cost a lot more than the Koenig in case of the Matsumoto, like a lot more, or they are much, much more fragile. The Koenig is perfect, like it's tough, it is very good at point blank, so it can really accompany the fast ships of the Prussian because it also wants to charge. And it gives huge benefits. I love the Koenig. Like, if you don't want the Falkenstein, Falkenstein uh, for some reasons, the Koenig is a very good boost as well. You will also have a Prussian frontline cruiser. Uh, as it's written in the description, you will only be able to build it as an Augustus or Schomburg. Um, okay. And uh, you will have a Ferdinand Advanced Cruiser, which is another cru is the one you see a little bit in the back. is basically a very angry blotcher with a Vierling Auto Cannon on the top. Uh, very powerful, focus gunnery. Like it's basically uh, the the big brother of the blotcher, and it's very good uh, ship as well. And it's from the Teutonic Order as well. You will have two Arminius frigates, so same as before, and also two Prussian destroyers. Again, the same as before. So that is what you get with the Cunning. Another very good box. If you really want to have, like, if you're sure you want to plunge into the Prussians, if you buy the starter, the Falkenstein, and the Koenig, wow. First of all, uh, with minus 10%, it's gonna be something around 150 euros. So if you compare it to, I don't know, Warhammer 40k, that is a lot cheaper than a full army at 40k. And this is not only going to be a very efficient fleet, 
it's going to be very modulable because all the weapons that you will get from one ship can go on another etc etc and you will have three very beautiful massive and coherent in appearance with each other flagships and yeah and that that's a lot of point that you will have a lot of variety you can have a little bit of everything if you uh, have this kind of budget like 150 euros and you want to jump into dystopian wars and you want prussians having these three boxes together is absolutely the best way to jump into the game and then we start to talk about more uh, esoteric choices uh, for example if you love the zeppelins and i don't know if you've seen the pictures of them but they're amazing you've seen them maybe on some of our battle reports i recommend you take a look uh, they look amazing and for a little bit more uh, because it costs 66 euros you have a powerful air force for your army so you will have a zeppelin uh, flagship uh, either the literal zeppelin which is uh, the name of the ship uh, which is an artillery piece with a ton of rockets very good long-range firepower or it can be an aircraft carrier which is the stark imperium which is the ship that you see here with a powerful named variant uh, called the prince Eugen. so this ship is absolutely massive it's made in plastic unlike, unlike many of the uh, flagships which are usually made of resin so it's very nice and comfortable to not only to build but also to transport so very nice from our cradle from having released this massive kit and as you can see it just looks so good like just have a look at the pictures if you've never seen it but this is really a beautiful centerpiece to put on the table you will also have two zeppelin cruisers which is those that you can see here they can basically be built with either this electric weapon um, to the front or you can build them with uh, aerial torpedoes for extreme range uh, firepower so they either want to rush very fast forward or to stay in the back uh, they have two variants one for the prussians one for the munich from the bavarians and it's like okay i will not go too much in details but you can really customize them all these ships uh, the cruisers the airplane everything they have flag barrage all of them so it's a very good source of flag barrage and then you will have four imperium zeppelin frigates which are this uh, not this one this one for example it's uh, munich i think and those are probably some of the best best ones of the game uh, you will see that uh, many times the imperium has the best ship of a category in its roster it's a very good uh, nation to play and uh, you can have especially the munich which are some of the most lethal ships in the game when they get at point blank they are extremely fast and when they get at point blank they obliterate things like absolutely uh, they've been nerfed and have they been nerfed enough i don't know but uh, having four munichs uh, which is one of the ships that you can build with this uh, sprue uh, is is absolutely a great deal and a great idea you also have four of the adorable plif oh, okay i will not try to plant flished escort tokens which are those little things uh, they are cheaper than normal escort tokens and you can put four of them around uh, your stark imperium and well first of all it will uh, reduce the um, vulnerabilities against rockets which is one of your big threats it will boost you if the enemy tries to send you its own SRS tokens which is also very good and plus it looks so good on the, on the table having this little zeppelin escorting your massive zeppelin like don't we all want to play this game because we love steampunk air fleets and steampunk surface fleets and all these ships like come on l let's try to make the our fleets look beautiful and those uh, escorts their tokens so they don't have movement they're just here to kind of indicate that uh, you have some defense bonus you could put a little dice uh, written for uh, on it next but it's so much cooler to have four little zeppelins flying around isn't it so yeah very good fleet this zeppelin battle fleet set uh, you can also have it if you share uh, with a crown player the um, Sturgeonium Skies uh, starter set, which is something that I would recommend if you get the chance. But if you don't have a crown player near you, absolutely buying the Zeppelin Battlefleet set. Uh, it's a lot of things that you get for the price. Plus you have so many bits actually because you will not uh, build all the variants. And it can make some very good uh, terrain ideas if you want to start to build your own islands. And then we start to go with the expensive pack. I will not go too much in detail, but the science of Jutland. First of all, look at the picture. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> Those are Scandinavians. So they are also part of the Imperium, but they're not Prussians. They are Scandinavians. So they have their own categories of ships. Uh, I will not too much into detail, but they're also very fast. They also want to be at point blank, not only because they have a, tons of uh, Stormclaw and Stormbringers as well, but also because they are even more focused on boarding than the Prussians. Uh, those guys, you're not surviving a boarding from uh, these uh, cyber uh, steampunk vikings you just don't 
uh, what do you get in this box? Uh, first of all, you have the Valhalla Fast Dreadnought, which is a massive battleship. Uh, it's called a Fast Dreadnought. It's not even in the picture. It's so big they didn't put it in the picture, I just realized. Uh, okay, but yeah, it's um, it's massive. It's bigger than an Elector, for example, or a Kaiser or Falcon Chin. It just It's one size bigger, so it's massive. There are a few variants. You can make it a little aircraft carrier that carries these uh, giant aircrafts on the side, so it looks very cool. You can make it so it's a submarine carrier, so it drops some smaller submarines from the back that act like, like SRS tokens. It's fast. It has two Stormbringers inside. Uh, it boards like a devil. You can put a shroud on it, so it's ins like it's insane ship for the value. I love the Valhalla so much. It's probably my favorite ship in terms of gameplay and maybe also in terms of appearance of the entire Imperium faction. Now, the Valhalla is uh, part of the reason why I keep playing the Imperium, uh, because it's such a cool looking ship, it's fun to play, it's amazing. The enemy, uh, it's quite fragile for the point cost, it's more like a glass cannon, uh, except if you start to play like me and you put a shroud, and uh, the enemy will see this huge uh, kind of like cruise missile <laughs> throwing at him and it needs to sing it because the Scandinavians even when they are crippled they keep shooting very well and they're getting even angrier so they still board even better when they are crippled so it makes for an extremely fun game when your opponent is like panicking and trying to shoot uh, sing down your ship before they get in range and board them it's a very fun gameplay and the Valhalla is the uh, incarnation of the Scandinavian playstyle you also have two Scandinavian frontline ships they are more glass cannon as we've said than the Prussians, they are like, like this. You have the Odin, you have the Jotun, which is very cool. Uh, again, look at some of our battle reports if you want to see them in action. Uh, very cool ships. You have two Scandinavian support cruisers. Uh, they have like so many variants. Um, we will soon publish, I'm not sure when I'll publish which video, but there will soon be, if it's not released yet, a Science of Jutland What to Build Guide, kind of like the same type of video that you see here, and we'll go more in detail of each variant, but they are more specialized, there is a ship that is very focused on ramming, there is a ship that is focused on being uh, sending the SRS token of the submarines, there is a ship that is uh, with a teleporting with a shroud, etc, etc. Like each of them have a very dedicated role, more than the Generalist frontline cruisers, but they are extremely powerful at what they do. Then you have four uh, half heavy corvettes, which are those guys, uh, very fast, each of them with a storm claw, okay, very cheap. They boost the defense of ships around them, thanks to corvette duty, and they can be attached to your flagships for one very very powerful uh, attack with the storm clouds and you can also attach them to the basic cruisers like you can attach them to Yotun or anything like this so very good you also have four Fenrir hunter submarines which do something that the Imperium in general doesn't do so good which is staying in the back and doing some extreme range firepower those do it very efficiently and for a very cheap cost I think it's like 30 points per model very good you have two Valkyrie Hunt Rotors, which are those little aircrafts here. Um, they are like Mass 1 uh, aerial units. Very powerful and uh, very fun. They combo well with one of the variant of the Valhalla, uh, which is the Asgard, which is the aircraft carrier for the Valkyries. And especially if you can attach them to the Odin, which is a type of a Scandinavian frontline cruiser, uh, they boost each other very well. Of course, they act as the two Raven of Odin and it makes a very powerful combo. Uh, basically, you make critical damage every turn uh, when you make this combo. Very fun. Last but absolutely not least, as you can see, you have two uh, Einerjahr uh, Vitruvian Colossi. Those things are some of my favorite giant robots of the game. Probably the, my favorite robot period in, ter in terms of appearance and of playstyle as well. They have this very powerful axe, uh, so you will do a ramming action. Then they each have two uh, heavy Vulcan batteries, which is very powerful weapon. They have this uh, Veiling Flak Array right there <laughs> in their arm. So they're also very good against Aerial and they're good shooting platform. They have inbuilt shield generator and they're tough. So they will pop out of the ocean, kind of like deep striking. Uh, I will not explain the rule, but yeah, they will basically deep strike on turn two. And then they will obliterate something with their ramming with their axe. Then they will shoot around. Then they will board because they're still angry Scandinavians in there. So they will do a very powerful boarding. And then your enemy has this very powerful robot in his back line with a shield, very tough. And he's like, how do I handle him? So yes, it is almost 200 points, this ship. 
but if you play it good, like don't throw it in the middle, holding the gates of the center of the table because that's not what he wants to do. But if you deploy it on the side of your opponent fleet, so it kind of like goes behind him where there is no uh, very efficient uh, unit to handle him, then you can just wreck havoc in the back of the enemy's field. And you also have four Imperium uh, Escort tokens. I'm not sure we see them. Yeah, okay, it's this. It's this very little ship. It's a mass one. No, it's not even a mass one. It's mass zero Escort tokens. Kind of like the Plift that we've seen for the Aerial units. Uh, they're very cute and they're nice. And it allows you to boost, for example, the Valhalla. And you have the uh, submarine tokens. It, this is a Valley Midget submarine. So you have specific SRS tokens. Uh, so. As you can see, it is 100 euros for the whole box, but as you heard, you have so many ships and the Valhalla, which is massive, and uh, you get minus 10%, let's remember, through Myobi Place. Again, thank you if you do that. And uh, the interesting thing with that is that they are Scandinavians, but they are also mercenaries. So all these ships that we've been talking about, if you later want to diversify a little bit and play another nation, in dystopian wars, so not the Imperium, but whoever, like I don't know, the Commonwealth, the Empire, the Alliance, whoever, the Science of Jutland can join as mercenaries for uh, whichever nation you will want to play. So they're kind of like an investment in the future because you will always be able to play them. Uh, be careful because only some of the Valhalla variants uh, can be uh, played as uh, mercenaries. So we'll talk about this more in the Science of Jutland, what to build. So watch it if you buy the box. But yeah, be careful. They're, you can play any variant. But still, it's a very good investment, especially since they are so fun to play. You will always want to have some steampunk Vikings making diversion, coming from the side and boarding your enemies. And the last box that we'll talk about, which is the most expensive box available in the game right now, is the Ice Maiden Battlefleet set. Uh, if you don't know the Ice Maiden yet because you're discovering the game, this is the biggest ship of the game. It's 114 euros for the box. You're like, wow, how much? But first of all, you have six frontline uh, cruisers more. Uh, so basically six crews. So you have six more Arminius, six more destroyers. So you can really start to have a lot um, of uh, like Totems and uh, Sigimirs. And actually, wait a second, you have 10 in total. So you can absolutely, uh, if you buy this box, make two times five packs of Totem destroyers if you really want to be naughty or you can make other configurations and you can also make a pack of eight aluminium frigates uh, for the damage and a pack of two just for having a cheap activation so all of this is good but why you buy this box it's not to get those little sprues it's to have the ice maiden dreadnought super carrier it's a mass six so you've seen the difference between a mass one and a mass three in the game the mass one being the smallest aluminium frigate and the mass three being the elector battleship well there is even more difference between the uh, Arminius and the Elector than between the Elector and the Iceman. This thing is so massive. It's more resonant. I think it's bigger. Like it is bigger than, for example, an Imperial Knight of Warhammer. Like this thing is just so massive. It takes the whole table. <laughs> it is basically an aircraft carrier that was constructing, constructed on an iceberg. They didn't build a ship. They just took an iceberg. They put a flight deck on it, and they put all the weapons around, and <laughs> you get the Ice Maiden. This thing is massive. It, like, it, it has its own rule, so that if it's too big to fit in the deployment zone, it's fine. Like, you just put the back and on the edge of the table, and if it's too big to fit in the deployment zone, whatever. It, it's too, so you get the idea of how massive this thing is. Uh, we've had it a couple times on our battle reports in the biggest like the big day battle report i don't think it will be released yet by the time you watch this video uh, we have at some point two ice maiden side by side on the table launching the attack it is an apocalypse sized game with like tens of thousands of points but two ice maiden next to each other just have a look how it looks on the table when the video is released and uh, yeah this thing a single ice maiden is 31 whole points 31. <laughs> Do you get like yeah, how? How? This is. It's not even Imperial Knight category in dystopian wars. This is a Titan. This is, if you compare it to a Warhammer, this thing is so big, so powerful. It's on its own, it's more than 500 points, almost 600, depending on, on the variant you get. This thing will polarize the game because the whole game will be like, okay, 
there is a small Prussian fleet around, except if you play apocalypse size games, but there is this giant thing in the middle of the table, and the entire enemy fleet is all these little insects trying to get around, avoid the swarms, massive swarms of bombers and aircraft that it will send. And then it has, for example, as you can see, one of the configuration is three Stormbringers, three Stormbringers, and like, then all the Veerling flak arrays, auto cannons, everything. You can have three uh, Augustus, like the Big Berta artillery ship, uh, and that's the cheap version. And you can have six, yes, six heavy Volgan batteries uh, peeking from the front with heavy firepower, with so many special rules. Like this thing is just insane. Have a look what it looks. And if you want to have this, uh, you will have more <laughs> Prussian frontline cruiser that you might need. But this is a very fun themed army. It, it is expensive. Uh, do go through my OB place for the minus 10% because uh, that starts to be a lot of money saved uh, through um, minus 10% when you start to buy so much. And uh, yeah, uh, I just love the Iceman. I hope every faction at some point will have a massive ship like this somehow, like a floating fortress, like the Windsor Castle, for example, for the crown that we have the tease might be coming. Something so massive that it is like when you bring out a Titan in the Warhammer game. The Prussians are, like the Imperium, are the only nation in the game that have this right now with the Iceman. So if you want it, uh, it's a very good and efficient option. It's not OP, uh, for sure. It's not the auto win button if you have a nice maiden, but it is efficient. It's no joke when you put it on the table. It's not jokingly bad just to make the other opponent uh, feel better. Uh, it, it is quite fun to play with and to play against. All right, that was a long video, but we had a lot of things to talk, especially in the how to expand part because the Imperium has so many options. I think it's the faction with the most options, the most boxes uh, available to itself. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know in the comments. Uh, if you liked it, let us know in the comments as well, because for each comment, uh, you have a little chance, a little ticket uh, to win an entire uh, crown uh, armada. Like I will say, it's so many ships. And there will be a second winner this time for an, a massive alliance force. A little bit smaller, but still so many flagships and everything. Lots of Levant ships. So do leave us a comment, uh, even if it's just to say like, yeah, I love you so, so much, guys. Or like, oh, no, it was terrible. But let us know in the comments, uh, even if it is constructive feedback. We're always willing to hear what we did not do good so we can do better next time. Uh, give us a thumbs up. It also really helps to get the game more known to other people. So YouTube offers it to more people. And uh, yeah, uh, share it with your friends and uh, let us know in the comment as well which uh, type of video you would like us to do uh, next time. There will be the signs of Jutland, but if you would like, like some specific tactics, uh, let us know for sure. Thank you very much for having watched until the end. Take care of yourself and those around you. And especially remember to keep spreading the love all around. Bye.